Welcome to the Hockey Writers Maple Leafs Lounge, a weekly show from our Toronto Maple Leafs writing crew, bringing you the latest news, rumors, trades, player grades, prospects, and much more. From training camp to the playoffs, from draft day to the trade deadline, our team covers everything that happens with the blue and white. Come on in and pull up a chair. Welcome to the Maple Leafs Lounge. Welcome back to the Maple Leafs Lounge. I am your host, Peter Barracchini. As always, I'm joined by my fellow colleague and Maple Leaf writer over at the Hockey Writers, Alex Hobson. Alex, another week of Maple Leafs hockey in the book. We're gearing up for the Maple Leafs as they get set to take on the New York Islanders. But before we get into the Leafs talk, how you doing, buddy? Doing good. Doing good. It was a fun week at the hockey. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, talking about it. Yes, it was definitely a great weekend. Obviously, there was the St. Pat's game against the Carolina Hurricanes, and then there was that thrilling game against the Ottawa Senators, where it looks like the uh, Battle of Ontario is starting to become a a rivalry once again, where maybe Toronto was always at the top and the Ottawa Senators were at the bottom, and now they're clawing their way back and being a little bit more competitive. But um, Alex, what do you make of that win against the Sens, where maybe they – didn't obviously they did not have the best game at all they were completely dominated in terms of score uh you know sh- shot attempts in terms of the maple Leafs getting 42 and the ottawa senators 71 obviously the senators controlled the pace of play in that game what do you make of that despite you know getting outshot getting outplayed and the maple Leafs still finding a way to win I don't really take too, too much away from that game just because I think it's pretty common knowledge that whenever Ottawa plays the Leafs, they play it like it's their Stanley Cup. So I was expecting Ottawa to come in and and play the Leafs really hard. And, you know, just to see the shots piling up the way that they did early on. And then obviously in the end, I think Murray had what, 40, 47 saves, was it? Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was just, it was to be expected for an, for an effort from like, for an effort like that from Ottawa. And, um, you know what? I, I I I know that they probably didn't look the best uh, overall. Like, and you know, it was a really greasy win, and you can you can point to where Ottawa is in the standings and try and make a concern out of it. But I think at this point, I I think all that really matters for them is just getting those two points, getting those one point whenever when they have to, and um, getting them however they can. Because I think the number one thing that matters right now is seeding against Tampa Bay in the first round and securing that home ice advantage. So. Um, yeah, it's not wasn't the best game, but on the other hand, they played Carolina really well the night before. Carolina's second best team in the entire league. So, uh, yeah, I'm not too too not too worried about it. I would say second half back to back. I thought Murray's played really well. Good bounce back game for him, and uh, just hope they can keep it going this week. Absolutely, Matt Murray really did stand on his head that game, and especially you know considering you know what happened with him in Ottawa, how he didn't have the best tenure there. Comes over to Toronto, and then he has the game that he did. Um, standing on his head again didn't get much help from the team obviously they did manage to find their way on the score sheet but they did blow I believe it was a 4-2 lead because they managed to get one goal back and then Brady Kachuk tied it up and then there was that back and forth in overtime and then of course the shootout which we will not get into with that because we do not like shootouts at all no matter what but you know it, it it does bring up the notion that, and, and I know you, like, like you said, I do agree that results matter. You know, they got a two points. It was a greasy, bad kind of win where maybe they shouldn't, but they still managed to get two points out of it. But they did have the lead. They did kind of blow it. But what do you make of this whole entire thing? Because I know on social media, there are a lot of fans painting the picture that it's all doom and gloom right now with the players that they added. It's, you know... They haven't played the best kind of hockey since the trade deadline or before the trade deadline, even though they have a really decent record. Um, Again, we talk about cause for concern, but with this kind of play, is it a cause for concern or is this just showing that the Maple Leafs are kind of resilient no matter what type of game they're in, even if they're getting outplayed, they still find a way to win? I mean, I I don't know. I feel like it would sort of be cherry picking to go go and look at the Leafs recent games and say that they've been slumping overall because, you know, they got a win against Carolina. Like I said, best one of the best teams in the league. Um, They grind out a win against Ottawa, which obviously I'm sure most people would have wanted the Leafs to maybe win that game in a little more of a convincing fashion. But in the end, Ottawa, like I said, always Ottawa always gives them a really hard time. So 
you know, just to see them get the win in that game on the second half of a back-to-back, I think was good for them overall. And, you know, I, I think that in terms of the additions that they made, like the Leafs have not had a deadline in recent memory where they've had as many outgoing players as they did and as many incoming players as they did. They added six players to their roster. So, you know what, if the Leafs don't look perfect in the in the first stretch of games, I know it's been a decent amount of games right by now. I would say I think it's maybe been like eight, nine, ten or something like that since the deadline. So, you know, it, it, I know that we're not really fresh out of the deadline, but I think a lot of people underestimate how long it can take for these these guys to gel. And especially the way that they've been running the 7-11 format, uh, you're not going to have the same line combinations like you're, you're not going to have the same line mates every every shift right so mm-hmm. certain players like Lafferty who haven't really gotten a chance to establish chemistry with any players except for these recent games obviously where he's been uh, on the third line um he spent a lot of time as that extra forward so I I wouldn't really be concerned about the way that they've looked I think that as long as they iron out these the, these sort of bumps in the road before they get to the playoffs I think that's all that really matters I think um, once this team gels and the, you know, they've established chemistry and they've established roles and they figure out who's going to be on that final roster going into round one, I think at that point, we're going to see a much better version of the team. Absolutely. Yeah. And injuries have played a factor too. I mean, you mentioned the 11, seven, how you, ha- how you're missing one forward and then you're trying to double shift one forward in, which could be a good thing if you're Matthews, Marner, Nylander, um, maybe even throwing Tavares in there because you do get that extra minutes to try and make an impact next shift. But again, like I said, the injuries, because you're still down Ryan O'Reilly. Luke Shem only had, you know, two games under his belt on that Western road swing in Canada or through Canada before he's seen Vancouver. And then, you know, after baby watch was done again, huge congrats to the Shen family. Um, he comes back and obviously he has the standout stellar performance that he has against the Carolina hurricanes where he's showing that physical play against the Ottawa senators as well. So I think there's that, I, like you said, they still need to build some chemistry. They need to get some games in, but I think right now Sheldon Keith needs to find that balance and stick with the line instead of juggling too much, have the set roster that you are going to go into the playoffs right now to avoid any type of, you know, offset. If like one player moves up one game, they go, they go down the next, you have a new defensive partner and you want to try and keep that consistency going and have that familiarity because that's only going to build up and it's going to help them out in the long run, especially come playoff time, because yeah, you do need to juggle players and lines in the playoffs and you need to coach at, at certain points when things are looking bad or things are looking down and you need to get some momentum, but he's been doing that quite a lot lately. And I think maybe right now, now that, you know, most of the players are in the lineup minus Ryan O'Reilly, you want to try and get that consistency going. Yeah. And I think that Keith realizes that too, the past couple of games he's been, or I won't say past couple of games, the last game that they played, they went back to the 12 and six format and every, yeah. every player had their own, had their own line and their own pairing or what, what have you. And it looks like they're going to go back to that on Tuesday against the Islanders or today against the Islanders, I guess, depending on when this is uploaded. But um, I, I think that, yeah, I think that we're at a point now where Keith is starting to see, you know, what he's got in certain players and he's, he, he's starting to have a better idea of how the team's going to gel. So I don't think they're going to be juggling the lines too much for the rest of the season, but you know, considering the way that injuries tend to happen in the playoffs and things like that, I, I do feel confident with the way that he has been juggling the lines just because there's so many different combinations that we know that they can go to if, if, if the worst happens. So. Absolutely. And one of those players that keeps moving up and down the lineup, especially into a top six role is Alex Kerfoot. And we've talked about him quite a bit, how inconsistent he has been this season, how he is, he is definitely snake bitten, but he did get the game winner shootout goal against the Ottawa senators. You know, you see the reaction from him, you know, I, I, I believe it was Justin Bourne who screen grabbed his reaction after scoring the goal. And then you see the video, of Mitch Marner, you know, his jaw dropped going to him, celebrating with him. Obviously, this isn't the season that Kerfoot would like to have, especially in a contract year where it's up. He needs to make an impact. He is that versatile, versatile player. But is despite that goal not counting, is this something that needs to happen for Kerfoot? And hopefully the goals start to come now and hopefully secondary scoring into the playoffs. I really hope so, because it feels like we've had this conversation about Kerfoot like every time he scored a goal this year. Every time he scores, yeah. it's like, okay. 
could this be the goal that finally takes some of the pressure off of him and allows him to go on a little bit of a scoring run? And it's in oftentimes it's ended up back in another slump. So I, I don't want to be too pessimistic about it because he, Kerfoot has proven that he can perform in the playoffs for he's one of their best players against Montreal in 2020 or mm-hmm. 2021 rather that also may have been an indictment of how terrible the rest of the team was. But um, overall, I mean, I, I think that it had to have been something for him because it sort of capped off a very grimy game against a, a divisional. You can start calling him a divisional rival now. It's the Battle of Ontario. It's been mm-hmm. that way for a while. Obviously, now Ottawa's coming to starting to climb back. So it's going to be a better matchup between the two. So the stakes are high in that game, and Kerfoot scored a big goal, even if it doesn't count on the score sheet. Excuse me. So um, I think that if anything, it would have to it would have to kind of jack some confidence up for him. Absolutely. And looking at the stats right now, he has 110 shots already is on pace to break the 117 he had last season where he had a shooting percentage of 11.1. But this year it's dropped down to 6.4. So he has his looks, but at the same time, we do notice his tendency to pass, elect to pass first. And even the shots that he gets, which should be easy goals, obviously it either sails wide, it gets directly shot at, you know, the goalie's crest in the middle. Kind of seems like the accuracy and the power isn't quite there compared to, you know, the third thing that he had last season. And we were expecting him to try and replicate that because, you know, his 28 points this season – just matches that of 2019, 20 in his first season with the Maple Leafs. So it's way significantly down from the 51 that he had last season. And he is moving up and down the lineup. But I think if he is able to try and get back on track, even though that goal doesn't count, it sure does feel like it for him because maybe this is something that could get the ball rolling. And, you know, if he's going to be a top six player for the team, he needs to start scoring and taking advantage, even if it's just a greasy goal and just, you know, potting in easy rebounds, you know, loose pucks, just driving hard to the net, just do what you should do in order to get out of a major, you know, slump that he's in right now. So definitely something to keep an eye on in regards to Kerfoot because, Obviously, fans are not happy with the production, given the contract that he's at, how he's been on the fourth line, third line, what have you. But again, fingers crossed that this is something of a good stretch for Kerfoot down the rest of the season and into the playoffs. Yeah, I can't imagine a situation where the Leafs will have him in a top six role in the playoffs, just because I think that I think that the way Cali Yarncroak has played these past couple of games, the fact that Matthews kind of expressed a desire to play with him more often, as long as bunting can sort of get going again, I think that's your top six right there. So uh, all I'm going to say is that if there's a point where Kerfoot's in the top six, I think something must've gone terribly wrong. So let's hope that the Leafs use their depth the way they can and uh, end up, end up keeping him on in the bottom six. And we will get to Cali Yarncroke in just a second. But before we do, let's go to our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Hockeypedia. Have you ever been looking for details on a team's player list? Do you want to know the Maple Leaf Stanley Cup history? Yeah, we know. Put 1967 in the comments. We get it. Who is in the 2015 Stanley Cup playoffs? What are the NHL awards and what's their history? If you're interested in these or any other hockey questions, make sure you check out and bookmark the Hockey Writers Hockeypedia page, an ever-growing collection of hockey resources that is invaluable to any fan looking for information. Look for the link in the show description and dive in today. As we as we basically segue into Cali Yarncroke, we're going to talk about the impact that he's had so far into that top six. And Alex... You came out with a great piece uh, looking into his top six uh, potential. I already, we, I also, obviously you talked about the signing. So it seems like we have a little bit of give and go here uh, with Cali Yarncroke. We're big fans because you wrote the, you know, signing piece. I wrote how his versatility is helping out the team into the top six. And then you came out with it, your recent piece on the top line. Uh, check that out at the hockey writers, Maple Leafs page, by the way. Um, obviously, Things are looking good because uh, he's on a bit of a stretch right now where he's very impactful. He has, you know, a four game point streak where he has six points in that span, three goals, three assists, but he did match his career total of 35 points that was set in 2017, 18 and surpass his goal total from that year with 17 right now. Um, Keith did allude to, or kind of had Yarncroke on the top line in preseason with Matthews and Marner, and he kind of looked great then. 
he looked fantastic against the Ottawa Senators. Is this a sign that maybe the Maple Leafs didn't need a top six winger, but at the same time, you have someone capable of chipping it offensively and sort of be that Michael Bunting 2.0 and Kelly Arncroke on the top line? Yeah, I mean, I don't. I wouldn't go as far as to say it's it. It indicates that they didn't need a top six forward because you know I think in a in a perfect world they would have had another top six forward and Yarn Croak would have been on the third line with O'Reilly. Um, either way, though, I think Yarn Croak has definitely been playing well enough in recent games to stay in that top six. And all I have to say is, if Austin Matthews says that you have one of the prettiest releases he's ever seen, that's that's got to mean something right there. I mean, all the players that Matthews has played mm-hmm. with since he joined the Leafs and. You know, Yarn Croak's a guy who's $2.1 million a year signed for four years, supposed to be a third line forward, maybe put up 15 goals, 30, 35 points a season. And, you know, he looks like he's on pace for 20 goals right now, um, on pace to pass his career high in points as well. So uh, I think at this point, he's played really well in that small sample size. And, you know, if you look back to January when they had him in the top six with Tavares and Marner temporarily, I think he played really well then as well. So, mm-hmm. I, I think that as of right now, you know, you got something working for you. I think you should, the Leafs should keep going with it. You might as well. Yeah, you just mentioned he is on pace for nine on pace for nineteen goals and thirty nine points. So obviously, it would be career highs, obviously in both. But I do agree, I and mean, we saw that release and the snipes that he had against the Senators, how they were just two absolute bombs of a shot in the high danger area, and that's where he tends to thrive. And even when he gets to that middle of the ice, he is very lethal when he releases his shot, and. You know, obviously Matthews was, I believe Kerfer was on that other wing as well, but, you know, Matthews seems to be feeding off uh, both Kerfoot and Yarncroke. Obviously when Matthew, we know Matthews has an elite level NHL shot. We saw that last year, this season as well, kind of down, but he's starting to pick it back up. But the fact that he has another shooter that he can rely on in Cali Yarncroke to get the puck off quickly, as we've seen his playmaking abilities, that kind of works out on the Maple Leaf saver because not, not only do you have, one in Austin Matthews, but two and possibly in Cali Yarncroke to tee up a really powerful shot and blast on net that can, you know, lead to a goal, second or third opportunities. And that's going to be huge, especially if he's going to be waiting teed up in the middle of the ice, because when he's going to unleash it, look out. Because uh, again, that, that that is one thing that I've taken notice with Cali Yarncroke, even like in, in years past, he did, I've seen his release and it was pretty decent, but it seems like he's had more power this time around yeah I, I think that like if you look at the goals that he scored this year a good chunk of them are right parked at the top of the circle um right, typically right where Ovechkin likes to hang out he gets a pass mm-hmm. from whoever his line mate is and he and he snipes the top corner so it's it's something that I think maybe a lot of people overlooked when the Leafs side him but it seems to be working out really nicely for them right now Absolutely. And even if, you know, Marner does get back on the top wing when the playoffs come around, if you have Cal Yarncroke, and again, a lot of people are going to say, oh, you know, Michael Bunting should still be back on the top line. I think he will get there. But at the same time, Cal Yarncroke plays a similar style to Bunting where he's got the speed, the the tenacity, maybe not as, you know, getting involved in extracurricular activities like bunting, but he can set up the four check. He can come out of, of the corners very well and quickly and, you know, get plays going from the blue line, find the crossing for another player. He has that going for him. And that's going to be a big, big factor for the Maple Leafs going forward because he can, he's a very underrated offensive minded player. Obviously they brought him for his two way game, but as we've seen right now, the offense is starting to come and, if he's still playing alongside Matthews and Marner, that's going to be very important down the line. Hundred percent, it is, and uh, I, I think that it would be it would be a blessing and one that the Leafs maybe didn't plan to have happen internally. But if you know they can come out of the deadline having saved assets that they would have spent on a top six forward because Callie Yarncroke is pretty much doing that job for free mm-hmm. in the in the uh, top six. If he can continue that long term, I mean, well, not long term, but through for, throughout the rest of the season, uh, I think that would just cap off what could be looked as a looked at as a perfect deadline, depending on how the per uh, the first round goes. Absolutely. And one key player that they, there was a little bit of a scare, but he is going to be back in the lineup against the Islanders. He was held out as a precaution against 
the Ottawa Senators, but that is Noel Ochari after he took a very high hit uh, from Jesse Puglia-Yarvi. And it did look incidental. Obviously, there was no penalty on the play. Keefe wasn't happy because then Kelly Yarncroke got called for interference. Again, we're going to leave it at the officiating is bad. I think we both can agree on that, but he was held out, you know, precautionary reasons, was okay, didn't make the trip, but now he is back. He was practicing. Uh, how big is this for the Maple Leafs fourth line, considering how much of an impact he has had and he kind of seems to be that glue that kind of keeps everyone together because they have that balance with, you know, David Camp and Zach Aston Reese. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, you know, you're doing a good job when you're a fourth liner and you're having us talk about you every single week since the Leafs have acquired him. Like, I actually think Achari's come up probably at least once every episode that we've done since that they made that trade. And sounds right. Um, if you know what, and he deserves it because he's been playing such good hockey. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I said it last week. I said it the week before uh, he just makes himself noticeable whenever he's on the ice, he goes out there, whether it's, whether he has the puck or he's away from the puck or he's in the neutral zone, he's always doing something, whether it's, it's a sh- scoring a goal at a clutch time or, you know, just, driving the team's energy up on the four check or throwing a big hit. Like he's just, he is the dream four fine player uh, that you want for the playoffs. So I, I, it is a really good thing that he, he didn't get hurt and uh, you know, makes sense that they, they, they kept him out of Saturday's game because they have a, an abundance of players and guys looking to get back into the lineup. So there's no point in risking injury even more and making him make that trip. But I think now that he's now that he's healthy again, he's good to come back in the lineup. It can only be a boost, and it'll be even better when O'Reilly comes back as well. Absolutely. If he was going to be a long term, that would have just put a damper in the Maple Leafs, you know, deadline plans because you know you're already out your top six four, you're already out your bottom six center slash wing uh, player that can you know be a very you know dynamic and impactful player in uh, key situations that if you need a timely goal, who are you going to go to on your fourth line? It's going to be Achari. So if he was going to be out long-term, that would have been a very big problem for the Maple Leafs. Definitely. Um, But let's move on to our final question. And it's going to be a quick fire, Alex. And as you know, we both keep in tune with the Maple Leafs prospects and their system. Ryan Torberg recently signed his ELC this past week. The Maple Leafs are get, or not the Maple Leafs, but the Toronto Marlies are getting some assistance in Dmitry of Chinnikov and Topi Niemela possibly or making the jump over to North America and possibly getting some ice time. Matthew Nyes, there's still the possibility that when his season is done, he's going to sign his possibly sign his ELC. But which one, which Maple Leaf prospect are you excited to see? It could be this season. It could be next season. Who is on your mind right now? Oh, that's a great question. Um, can I go? Does it have to be a Marley's prospect, or can I go a little off the board? You know what? I'll allow it. Okay, I'll allow it. I, I'm excited to see what Fraser Minton can do for this team when he's up with, with up with the team, and he might not be for another three, four years. But, but <laughs> you know, Fraser Minton, I think you know, just watching his game, high hockey IQ. He's a guy that looks like his ceiling could potentially be a high end top six center, and. uh You know, it's going to be a long time before he's here, but I think it's going to line up right around when Tavares' contract expires. And uh, if the Leafs have a replacement for him right then and there, I think that'll be uh, that'll be really cool. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do, although it's going to we're going to have to wait a while for it. Yeah, he definitely has that awareness, that smart two way ability. I, I, I do think that is a really great pick, but I'm interested to see what Toby Niemela can do. Obviously, the Maple Leafs need help on the right hand side. We're seeing what Timothy Lilligren can do. And obviously with his improved play, obviously Niamela may be two, three years away. Um, didn't quite have the best season after he had a dominant season last year. But at the same time, uh, there was, I believe there was like, you know, coaching changes and mentality in their play and maybe took a bit of a hit on his production, but he's still an effective uh, play driver, puck moving defenseman, but very smart in his own end. So he has that two way ability and another right-handed shot. Uh, so Obviously, the Maple Leafs need those type of defensemen. I do think that if Lilligren showing promise, Niamela obviously overtakes him as that top defensive right-handed shot prospect. Obviously, rest of San Diego is also traded as well. But him coming in right now, I think it's going to be a treat for every for us to see who haven't been able to see him aside from international tournaments. Uh, clips of him and his play over in Finland. 
the fact that he's going to be in Toronto right now and uh, continuing with his development and play the system that they wanted to play. And I, obviously they're going to let him play to his strengths. is going to be a really great sign. And, and it's going to be really fun to see him hit the ice with the Marlies uh, this season, next season, what have you. I'm really looking forward to seeing what Niamela can do. And that is it for this episode of the Maple Leafs Lounge. Once again, be sure to check out Hockeypedia. There is going to be a link in the show description below to find out everything hockey-related over at the Hockey Writers. Uh, once again, Alex, thank you again for, uh, for joining us, and we will see you next time on the Maple Leafs Lounge.